Hello and welcome. It's a, an absolutely gorgeous afternoon here in Seattle. Um, my name is Barbara Cochran and I'm the director of the Deterney Center for Healthy Aging here in the School of Nursing and today I'm representing the Northwest Geriatric Education Center which is putting on this lecture series. We've got about three more to go for this year and I want to remind you that these lectures as well as lectures from all previous sessions um, are posted on our nwgec.org website available for free. You just register so that we can sort of count numbers for our funding agency. Today I'm very, very happy to introduce to you Alvin Matsumoto. He's an attending physician in internal medicine and geriatric medicine and endocrinology and metabolism at the VA Puget Sound Healthcare System here in Seattle. He has broad clinical interests in the area of male reproductive endocrinology and men's health osteoporosis, metabolic bone disease, pituitary disease, as well as general adult and geriatric endocrinology and metabolism. His research program examines the physiological and clinical effects and mechanisms of action of androgens and their active metabolites in young and aging men. Dr. Matsumoto directs and sees patients in the GREC um, osteoporosis and andrology clinic a multidisciplinary subspecialty referral clinic for the evaluation and treatment of patients with osteoporosis and other metabolic bone disease and male hypogonadism. He has published over 145 peer-reviewed original research papers and over 70 invited reviews and book chapters and today he's here to tell us about thyroid disorders in older adults. Welcome. Great, thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> it's a great um, opportunity to talk about this topic that I talked about, I think, about three or four years ago, and to probably a different audience, uh, it sounds like. So today what I'm going to do is um, cover all thyroid disorders in older adults, which is a big task. And we're going to start out by giving you some generalizations about um, geriatric endocrinology, talk a little bit about the physiology of the thyroid axis and how it's affected by aging. And then we're going to talk about disorders of thyroid function um, and keying in on hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism first. And then uh, we'll talk about nodular disease, nod solitary nodules, and a little bit about cancer to, um, to sum it up. And then we'll summarize. So what's, what's different about thyroid disorders in older adults? Um, and there are quite a few differences that I'm that are being going to be pointing out on the on these next two slides here. And um, let me just grab this thing. And in terms of clinical presentation and diagnosis, it's it's very um, important to recognize that not only for thyroid disorders but for a lot of disorders, uh, the present clinical presentation is often atypical. And because uh, the symptoms and signs of thyroid disorders are relatively nonspecific, uh, it, it can be confused with a lot of other disorders. Um, it's important to recognize that in, in, in all geriatric populations that often what the initial presentation is uh, for individuals that present with thyroid disorders is a, is a geriatric syndrome such as cognitive impairment, depression, falls, uh, reduced function. Um, in addition to the fact that it's atypical presentation, there uh, often are multiple comorbidities that occur um, in older adults and, and it often is to the point where they may mask or mimic thyroid disease or, and sometimes even alter the presentation of thyroid disease. And we have a, a lot of well elderly uh, individuals that in fact attribute a lot of the uh, symptoms of thyroid disorders as just getting older and old age. So as a result of the the fact that clinical, clinical signs and symptoms may be um, um, somewhat nonspecific and atypical, we often have to rely pretty heavily on thyroid function testing, that is blood testing for thyroid function. Um, and as a result, um, we have to also consider the fact that in fact uh, uh, non-thyroidal illnesses, uh, comorbidities that, uh, that exist in older individuals could also affect thyroid functions and mislead sometimes individuals uh, in thinking that someone has a thyroid disorder because of a biochemical test, even though the symptoms and signs may be somewhat atypical. In terms of treatment and prognosis, 
I think it's important to recognize that thyroid hormone replacement um, doses are reduced in older populations because of decreased clearance and um, the sensitivity of end organs, particularly the heart and the brain, uh, are, are sometimes very sensitive to very small amounts of thyroid hormone. So the sort of geriatric tenet of start low and go slow, I think, uh, is very important, certainly, in thyroid disorders um, to prevent any adverse effects. Uh, comorbidities here also play into treatment uh, in that if um, thyroid hormone treatment is inappropriately given, that is, too much is given, for example, it may actually worsen uh, comorbidities. And the best example probably is osteoporosis. Individual that's overtreated with thyroid hormone may actually have worsening of their bone loss as a result of that. So it's important to recognize the uh, comorbidities that might actually get be affected by thyroid hormone over or sometimes under replacement. Um, all, of the, all of the comorbidities that exist, um, as a lot of people know, predispose you to drug interactions because there are multiple drugs to treat the comorbidities that exist. And anytime you have more than five or six medications on board and you add another one, thyroid hormone, you're just asking for, for potential drug interactions. Um, and it's particularly true for uh, medications that might affect, for example, thyroid hor hormone absorption. And we'll talk a little bit about that. It's also important to recognize this: the more problems you have, the less likely you are to comply with, uh, with um, some of the medications or perhaps all of the medications. <laughs> and uh, so poor compliance is often a real difficult problem in geriatrics. Um, and then finally, in some individuals with really um, severe coronary disease, for example, like unstable angina, you may actually have to compromise the amount of thyroid hormone that, you're al that you can give in order to at least get some thyroid in there because the angina might get worse. And I'll tell you that that's not common, but, um, but does occur. So not common, but does occur. And so you have to be fairly individualized when you talk about thyroid hormone replacement and not often just go by the textbook by say, you know, saying that you need to have such and such a dose and the TSH absolutely has to be in the normal range. You might have to accept that the TSH level in a hypothyroid patient might have to actually be above normal and they may be slightly hypothyroid, uh, not to worsen uh, angina, for example. And then finally, the prognosis. I think it's important to remember that even with well-differentiated thyroid cancer, which occurs pretty commonly in older individuals, the prognosis is, is much worse. Um, and it probably is in large part due to the coexisting uh, illnesses that, uh, that are present in older adults. But, uh, but thyroid hormone cancer death itself is also increased. And there's an increased incidence of more aggressive types of thyroid cancer, like thyroid lymphoma and anaplastic thyroid cancer, which, which are really diseases of older adults. They don't occur in younger individuals. Um, so how do you approach somebody uh, uh, in terms of clinical evaluation uh, um, of thyroid uh, disease? And I think it's important to recognize sort of three major categories of uh, evaluation. You need to evaluate function, thyroid function. Uh, you need, and then you also have to uh, evaluate anatomy, and, and finally, um, you have to consider the potential of modifying effects of age. So in terms of thyroid function, the, the key question is, is the patient hyperthyroid, hypothyroid, or euthyroid? Um, and always keep in the back of your mind that if somebody is sick and it has uh, certain types of non-thyroidal illness, that thyroid functions may actually be affected by the illness and the individual may not have a thyroid disorder. The key components of the evaluation of um, function involve clinical examination, uh, first of all, history, I should say, and then clinical examination, and two tests, primarily TSH and, uh, and occasionally uh, TSH in addition to free T4 um, uh, levels are done. Um, separate from function, you need to evaluate the anatomy. That is, is the thyroid normal? Does it feel normal? Or is it enlarged? If it's enlarged, hence a goiter, 
Is it diffusely enlarged or is there a multinodular component? Is it a lumpy, bumpy thyroid or is it pretty smooth uh, and enlarged? Uh, or is there a solitary nodule? Is there a single nodule that really stands out that's, um, that's present? And the main question there is, is it benign or is it malignant? So those are the components of the main components of the evaluation. But overlying all of these is the fact that age may influence the presentation uh, in terms of function and the thyroid function tests themselves. And age may also in influence the anatomy. That is, it's not uncommon to have um, a younger individual present with a goiter and, and Graves disease, but individuals that are older may have Graves disease and not have a thyroid enlargement at all. So again, age kind of overlies the, the both components. So a little bit about the physiology of the thyroid axis. Um, having trouble getting this. Can I use this mouse? Can you see this mouse or can we they can, see it? But nobody else can. Um, so you have to sort of I'm click gonna, on it and then drag it. Is that what you have to do? Yeah, unfortunately. I hate that. OK. <laughs> All right. So this is a cartoon of the hypothalamic pituitary thyroid axis. OK. And, <laughs> and I want to point out a few, um, a few points of, of, of uh, importance here. First of all, the thyroid, uh, the hormone that the thyroid gland makes is primarily T4, tetraiodothyronine, or T4. Very little T3, or triiodothyronine, is made by the thyroid. In fact, most T3 is made by peripheral conversion of T4 to T3 by this enzyme called 5' prime deiodinase. Um, important to also recognize that both, for both thyroid hormones, T4 and T3, almost all of the thyroid hormone in blood is bound to serum proteins. So you see it's 99.97% of T4 and 99.7% of T3 is bound to serum proteins. So the only component that's really free of binding and, and, and available to tissues to act is uh, a very small fraction of what's actually circulating in blood. And when you measure total T4, you're really measuring uh, only really bound T4. Um, so it's not, uh, uh, I think, a surprise that the key component of measurements of, of thyroid hormone involve free measurements of free hormone values, free T4 as the key component here. It's also important to remember that there's this negative feedback axis. That is, when T4 levels are too high, they feed back to the hypothalamus and pituitary and suppress the stimulating hormone, thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH, uh, uh, to very low levels. If thyroid hormone levels are too low, there's less negative feedback, and TSH levels increase as a result of, of, of the levels of T4. And that's important because this is why TSH is the most sensitive measure of thyroid function there is in blood. Because this system, this feedback system, is so sensitive that even changes within the normal range of T4 can affect TSH. And so it's not uncommon to have a situation where T4 levels look like they're within a broad normal range, but TSH levels are elevated because what the, thyroid, what the pituitary and the hypothalamus feel is that there's not enough T4 for that individual, and as a result, TSH levels go up. That's subclinical hypothyroidism. So, so, uh, so it's important to remember that TSH and free T4 are the major hormones that we uh, have to measure uh, in evaluating thyroid function. What happens with age? Well, uh, with age, you tend to get a lumpy, bumpy thyroid. Basically, there, there are nodules and multiple nodules that form within the thyroid. You get less uh, uptake of iodine, which is the main substrate for thyroid hormone synthesis. And as a result, you actually get reduced thyroid hormone production from the thyroid. T4 levels or T4 production goes down. But the levels don't change because, in fact, the metabolism or the clearance of T4 is also reduced. And so it matches. The, the production decrease matches the clearance uh, decrease, and you basically have very little change in, in T4 or free T4, total T4 or free T4. What happens, I think, uh, is, is complicated with TSH basically doesn't change much.
I have here on this slide that it goes up a little, and that's actually true in iodine-sufficient um, countries like the United States, but is not true for iodine-deficient countries. So the reason I have it slightly increased here is we're talking about presumably the United States for everybody that's on this particular uh, telecom or this particular uh, call uh, or, or listening to this lecture. If you were in an iodine deficient area, in fact, TSH levels tend to go down with age. Um, suffice it to say that the TSH levels, even though I have an arrow that goes up, it remains mostly within the normal range. So I think you don't have to remember that that's that's the situation um, in most situations as, as someone ages. So what happens to um, thyroid function when you have illness? And this is a terribly complicated uh, slide. Non-thyroidal illness is abbreviated NTI. And I just want to point out one thing uh, on this slide. Well, two things. The one thing that's pretty obvious is that almost every part of the thyroid axis may be affected by non-thyroidal illness. And for the majority of the audience that's listening to this call, you don't have to necessarily remember all of these things. Um, um, as a primary care doc, presumably, um, you know, you will uh, have some options to get referrals to endocrinologists or some specialists that could, could help you with some of the effects. I think the most important thing to remember is that TSH levels with illness can go up or can go down, okay? So even though TSH levels are a great indicator when someone is well, as we talked about because of negative feedback and the sensitivity of the axis, in a well individual, it's a very good indicator of thyroid function, but when someone gets sick, the sickness itself or the illness itself can actually affect TSH up or down. And that's why in a, a population that's sicker than older, you need to measure both free T4 and TSH. I have here that free T4 can also be affected by illness, but it's these arrows are much smaller. And that's to try to emphasize that, in fact, there are a few things that actually affect free T4 um, uh, few illnesses that affect free T4. Much, so free T4 is less affected by illness than total T4. So this is an important slide. So I spend a little time on this slide. Um, these are TSH levels. Uh, the dashed line is the limit of sensitivity. Less than 0.1 is, is the sensitivity for most thyroid or TSH assays. The solid lines are the normal range. Okay, of TSH. So on a normal euthyroid individual, TSH levels are normal. That makes sense. In somebody with primary hypothyroidism, that is they have a problem in the thyroid, less negative feedback, TSH goes up. No problem. In somebody that's hyperthyroid, their thyroid makes too much thyroid uh, hormone or they're taking too much thyroid hormone, the extra thyroid hormone feeds back to the pituitary and uh, suppresses the TSH. So that's no problem. But look what happens with non-thyroidal illness. Uh, and this is what I want to try to emphasize on this slide, is that TSH by and large is in the normal range, but it may be elevated or it may be suppressed in illness. Um, and so I think TSH then becomes not as good an indicator of thyroid function when someone is sick. So in a non-well elderly, um, or the sick elderly, I think you have to remember this, this particular issue, that you, that you also need to measure free T4 as well as TSH in order to evaluate thyroid function adequately. As well, as you, <coughs> excuse me, as you get older, uh, I told you that the thyroid starts developing nodules or lumps and bumps, and some of these nodules make thyroid hormone independent of TSH. They're called autonomous or autonomous nodules. And they don't pay attention to TSH. They just make a fixed amount of TA, uh, thyroid hormone, uh, irregardless of what TSH is doing. And so as a result of that, you tend to get a little overproduction because it's not paying attention to the normal signals. And as a result of that, TSH gets suppressed and sometimes gets suppressed below normal. Even though the individual is completely normal in, in every other way, their TSH may be below the normal range, as is shown here. 
And then finally, in this, in this shaded area, um, older as well as younger individuals develop hypothyroidism because they have a pituitary tumor or they've infiltrated disease of the hypothalamus or the pituitary. So they don't make an appropriate amount of TSH for the level of T4. In this instance, T4 may be very, very free T4 may be very low, and TSH may be either in the low norm, mid to low normal range or below normal. And, and that's another situation where TSH levels by themselves don't give you a good indication of thyroid function. So everything in this box is really are, are the indications that, to also measure free T4 as well as TSH. So as we just discussed, TSH is a good test for outpatient screening of thyroid function. Uh, but alone, uh, it's not sufficient in sick patients um, because there are a variety of things that suppress TSH listed here. Glucocorticoids, prednisone, high-dose prednisone, for example, dopamine agonists, fasting, head trauma. And then as you recover from an illness, often you, know, you see these individuals after they've been in the hospital, they haven't completely recovered. There actually may be a transient increase in TSH during that recovery phase. And so, again, in those situations where there's sickness, measure a free T4 as well. A free T4, uh, the gold standard measurement is unfortunately expensive and is a send out to a commercial uh, reference laboratory. Um, but it is, it is the gold standard to measure free T4 by what met this method called equilibrium dialysis. It's actually a, it's a way of measuring the very, very small percentage of free T4 that's around in blood. Um, but what we have are these direct T4 assays in most uh, local labs, like the University of Washington or any of the local labs in the communities, will have free T4 estimates. But the only caution I have here is this caution sign is that it's in, in these direct assays, even though they're quick, they're cheap, they're fast, they actually tend to um, be unreliable when binding protein levels are very high or very low. TBG levels are very high or very low. That's the main binding protein for thyroid hormone. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I think this is something where you'd be referring individuals if they are sick and they have funny looking thyroid function test, my suggestion is that this is even hard for an endocrinologist and for, certainly for endocrine fellows that I train, it's hard for them to actually know what's going on without a lot of thought. Uh, because often sickness doesn't come in just with one, one thing. It comes in with multiple. Somebody might be on Dilantin is also chronically ill, uh, also have uh, psychiatric admission, you know, so there, there are often a, a variety of things, illnesses and medications that can affect thyroid function. So my suggestion is that if there's something that's not classical and what I've just mentioned, um, that uh, a referral go off to an endocrinologist to try to sort through what exactly is going on. So who does one screen? For thyroid function, I think there's no question that individuals with geriatric syndromes um, frailty, failure to thrive, uh, cognitive impairment, chronic disability um, certainly should be screened. And that even well elderly with a history of thyroid disease or autoimmune disease, unexplained depression, cognitive impairment, or, or even high cholesterol that's new <coughs> should be screened. People with atrial fibrillation, heart disease, and osteoporosis. Those are all pretty good indications for at least measuring TSH if they're well, and free T4 and TSH if they're not so well. I think the controversy is in the vast majority of people, as you all know, are, uh, who are um, older are actually doing quite well. And they're asymptomatic, and you know, they're not necessarily complaining of anything. Um, and I think the screening of those individuals, I think, is controversial. My tendency is not to do it unless there's a reason to do it. But I know a lot of um, primary care folks uh, would say, well, it's, it's worth screening. I think the value of screening a well elderly individual, I think, is, is questionable. And so I don't necessarily hold to that. I think there's no question if there's any reason uh, to, <clears throat> to, to think that some thyroid dysfunction might actually be contributing to geriatric problems, uh, then I think they should, you should be measuring um, free T4 and TSH. So we're going to move on to thyroid disorders. 
And we're going to start out with hypothyroidism, primarily because it's the most common, certainly overt hypothyroidism is a lot more common than overt hyperthyroidism as one gets older. Shown here on this slide is basically the likelihood of developing overt hypothyroidism in, in yellow um, versus hyperthyroidism in green as you get older as a function of age here. <clears throat> and what you'll see is that um, as you get older, the, uh, the chances of you developing uh, overt hypothyroidism go up quite a bit. I'll just also point out that even though the, uh, the, the chances of developing overt hyperthyroidism don't go up, I think this is in part related to the fact that most hyperthyroidism in older individuals don't present with classical presentation. So overt is just a matter of who's looking for it and how overt it is in terms of clinical presentation, number one. Number two is that <clears throat> this is, uh, it, it doesn't go away with old age. I think that's the other thing to point out is that hyperthyroidism can occur in older adults. So the classical symptoms of hypothyroidism are, are shown here. Uh, there's basically the, both the signs and the symptoms you can think of as hypometabolic condition, as a hypometabolic condition. And if you like analogies, you can uh, go with, to Winnie the Pooh and say, this is Eeyore. And th these are individuals with dry skin, um, some hoarseness, some you know, cold intolerance, weight gain, constipation, uh, decreased hearing, paresthesias, fatigue, weakness, muscle cramps, depressed mood. These are very, very nonspecific symptoms. As well, they may be slow in movement. They may have dry skin and coarse hair on physical exam. They may have actually pretty cold skin and periorbital edema. They may have a slow heart rate and slowed relaxation phases of, of their deep tendon reflex. Now, the relaxation phase of the deep tendon reflex, often, you know, when I was uh, training, used to be thought of a, as a pretty specific uh, sign of hypothyroidism. But in reality, uh, as, as I've gotten older and more medications have been used, particularly beta blockers and more potent beta blockers, it's clear that, that um, that beta blockers can affect the relaxation time uh, of these reflexes. And as well, as I got into or geriatrics from endocrinology, as I saw more older and older individuals, in fact, age itself, irrespective of whether you're on a beta blocker, may affect the relaxation phase of reflexes. So specificity of these, of these signs and symptoms is certainly not very good. And in fact, in older adults, there may be certain uh, clusters of presentations that I think are would be somewhat atypical in a younger population. So yes, there's a there's a group of older individuals that present with what's called mixed edema. That is the dry skin, the hair loss, the periorbital edema, and the cold intolerance. That, those are sort of classic symptoms. But very commonly in the older individuals, you'll have a sort of a neurobehavioral or cardiovascular presentation, and that probably has to do with the fact that as you get older, there may be some underlying neurobehavioral issues as, as well as maybe cardiovascular issues that, that will make these organs, these end organs more sensitive and therefore the presentation may really be more uh, aligned to these underlying conditions. So paresthesias or carpal tunnel syndrome, ataxia, cognitive impairment, depression, apathy, and psychosis even, you know, myxedema psychosis can actually occur. Uh, and as well as, as more severe bradycardia, pericardial effusion or fluid retention around the heart, uh, as well as frank increase in worsening of um, congestive heart failure can occur. So periorbital edema, I just wanted to point out in, in, in an older individual, is not what you would normally uh, associated with perio. This is periorbital edema, no question, but these are just bags under this person's eyes, okay? I mean, I get those, I mean, I might have them today. For all I know, you'll have to tell me from the, in the audience. But it's certainly uh, not uncommon if you don't get enough sleep to get some periorbital edema or bags under your eyes. So I don't look for periorbital edema that's pathologic uh, under the eyes. I look for it over the eyes, OK? It's, it's very actually uncommon unless if there's no disease of the periorbit uh, to actually have um, frank periorbital edema in the upper, upper lids in the upper part of the eyes like this individual has. So this individual has periorbital edema. Um, I think for the individuals uh, that their primary care docs, I think it's important. If you do get an EKG and you notice that there's a um, 
a fairly low voltage EKG, and more importantly, that there might be some nonspecific STT wave changes on, on the uh, precordial leads, and the voltage is particularly low more on the precordial leads than on the limb leads, that you should be getting a chest X-ray to look for whether or not there's a, a pericardial effusion, which can occur in, in, in particularly in older individuals with, uh, with hypothyroidism that may have underlying heart disease. So this is an individual with pericardial effusion before thyroid hormone replacement and after thyroid hormone replacement. It's, it's not associated with tamponade, pericardial tamponade, uh, but it usually, I should say, nothing's for sure all the time, but um, it is something to be aware of because it can affect hemodynamic function. So how do you diagnose hypothyroidism? Well, um, it's pretty straightforward, and we've talked about this. A measurement of a free T4 will be low, and TSH will be elevated if it's primary hypothyroidism. Primary hypothyroidism, a problem in the thyroid, it doesn't make enough thyroid hormone, less negative feedback, TSH goes up. Uh, it can be a secondary hypothyroidism. In this instance, free T4 is low, but TSH may be completely normal. Uh, or it may be inappropriate. It's certainly inappropriately normal. It should feed back and increase, but it doesn't. Uh, or it may be frankly low, and it depends on the severity of what's causing the secondary hypothyroidism. Keep in mind that there can be transient increase, as I said before, or decrease of TSH with non-thyroidal illness, NTI. So you always have to keep that in mind when you're evaluating these blood tests. And you know, when in doubt, repeat them. They're not that expensive, okay? And so hopefully people don't treat an individual um, uh, with just one test, with, with just one blood test. Often I see this, that individuals with a suppressed TSH always get thyroid hormone without sometimes even confirming that free T4 is low. So I think that's, that's something to keep in mind that I see a lot of uh, uh, happening. Um, so we had mentioned the fact that sometimes TSH can be elevated, but free T4 is normal. And this is what's called subclinical hypothyroidism. They may have very little in the way of symptoms that are referable to hypothyroidism. But their, and their thyroid hormone level in blood is actually normal, but their TSH is elevated. This actually is the most common situation in older adults. And it's far more common than overt hypothyroidism. And so I'll spend a little time on this um, uh, separately. Sometimes you can measure thyroid uh, antibodies or anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies. For this audience, I think I would, ref I would uh, reserve this for the subspecialist or the referring uh, endocrinologist to do, only in that it's relatively expensive. And as you get older, the chances of you having antibodies, not only to thyroid, but <laughs> to almost anything, actually goes up. So there's a good likelihood that this may be up and it may be a, what's a false positive uh, antibody test. So I'm not sure you should be measuring that in everybody. So what could be the cause of hypothyroidism in an older individual or a younger individual? And then you can divide this up into primary versus secondary hypothyroidism. And the, the major cause of uh, of hypothyroidism, both in younger as well as in older individuals, is Hashimoto's thyroiditis or Hashimoto's disease. It's an autoimmune disease where there's actually autoimmune destruction of the thyroid, uh, often associated with a, a mild goiter uh, early on in younger individuals and in older individuals, no goiter. In fact, hard to palpate thyroid. But uh, I put this up only in not so much in that you should all remember what the causes of primary and secondary are. Uh, but uh, to point out the complexity of managing these uh, and that I, my personal feeling is that, um, uh, that you should at least contact an endocrinologist regarding some of these. Um, if somebody has had their thyroid completely removed, it's a, it's, and you don't have to consult an endocrinologist to do that. But if somebody is potentially uh, had a radioactive, um, I'm sorry, uh, had iodine contrast uh, media, for example, and has developed symptoms of hyperthyroidism uh, or is on amiodarone uh, for their cardiac disease, uh, 
uh, and has, has developed hyperthyroidism. Um, th these are very difficult situations to manage, and, and my suggestion is that you get some help in um, actually managing these disorders. And certainly, if somebody has a pituitary tumor or hypothalamic pituitary disease, uh, that's a good time to get some help uh, by uh, referring them to an endocrinologist. So in summary, there's some, the hypothyroidism in older adults is a very common problem, 2 to 10 percent. I didn't mention that. Most of it's subclinical, I did mention. And I mentioned the atypical nonspecific presentation shown here. Um, uh, I didn't mention, but I should have mentioned earlier, is that um, and as you probably all know, if you take care of older individuals, that the first manifestation may be a geriatric syndrome because the individual may already be susceptible to falls, but the, you know, the incident increase in falls, for example, may be a manifestation of thyroid disease in somebody that's older, uh, as well as maybe decreased mobility or incontinence as a result, maybe functional incontinence as a result of the decreased mobility. But again, always keep in mind and ask yourself, is there an illness that may be buggering up the thyroid function tests? Okay, And that's the kind of thing that is, is, will hold you in good stead if you just give it a thought and make sure that there's maybe not something else going on and give a call to somebody that might know. So what about subclinical hypothyroidism? Probably the most common disorder, uh, thyroid disorder in older adults. Um, and I'm sure all of you have seen it um, out there. It's a situation where their free T4 is normal and the TSH levels are increased. The prevalence is quite high, 4 to 10 percent in lots of series. And the prevalence increases with age. So again, you're going to see it in an older population, a geriatric age population. I think the important things to remember are that there are a subset of individuals with that start out having subclinical hypothyroidism that will actually progress to overt hypothyroidism, more severe hypothyroidism. And the, and the rate of progression is about 1 to 2 percent per year. Um, it's actually a little bit less than that, I think. But, but at any rate, there is a progression that can occur. And that progression tends to occur in individuals with, with at baseline, uh, have TSH levels that are higher. Uh, for example, a greater than 10, that may have an underlying goiter to begin with, that may have low normal free T4 levels, not T4 levels, free T4 levels that are in the mid part of the normal range, but maybe low normal. And this is where antibodies sometimes are, uh, getting antibodies is helpful in that uh, individuals with very high titer anti-thyroid antibodies uh, are the ones that tend to then progress over time to overt hypothyroidism. And so, in fact, these are situations where you might actually treat earlier rather than later uh, to try to prevent uh, overt hypothyroidism that goes undiagnosed or lost to follow up. I think it's also very important to recognize, however, that 50 percent of the cases, TSH that's originally elevated can actually normalize. In, in, in about half the cases. So just following somebody is not a bad idea. Uh, I, I really think that we don't do enough of that. We tend to kind of start treating right when there's an abnormality. And my, my suggestion, particularly for borderline cases, is certainly to, to use some clinical judgment, certainly. But um, there's no harm in waiting for six months or so or a year to, to recheck the values to see what direction we're going in. TSH levels are not very expensive, by the way. And in some places, I can't, I can't relate to the University of Washington, but in the VA system, it's, it's certainly in, in the range of about $9 or so. So it's a lot cheaper than a um, total body CT scan uh, that I see a lot of orders for. <laughs> okay. um, associated uh, disorders are cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and, and even cardiovascular mortality, when, especially when TSH levels are above 10. But um, I'm going to emphasize again and again with these subclinical disorders, I'm going to come back to this in subclinical hyperthyroidism, that we don't know whether treatment actually affects any of these associated outcomes. These are all epidemiologic studies that have associated these, these, these outcomes with high TSH, normal free T4 levels. And we don't know that thyroid hormone treatment really will make a difference in these outcomes at this point in time. There are 
there are studies that favor and against it. We don't have very large randomized controlled studies to actually answer this question. So in terms of treatment of older adults, I think individuals where treatment would be indicated are basically if they are symptomatic. Uh, uh, generally, if they have a goiter, um, that's usually an indicator of Hashimoto's. If they have a TSH level that's above 10, that's generally a cutoff that's considered to be somebody that you might want to treat, particularly, particularly if they have antithyroid antibodies, antithyroid peroxidase antibodies. Individuals that are asymptomatic in the range of 4 to 10, you might monitor. And again, that's highly based on clinical judgment, but I think it's not an unreasonable thing to do. Uh, you're not going to die from a TSH of 6. Okay. Well, I mean, I shouldn't say you're never going to die, because you may die of something else, but you're not going to die from the TSH of 6. The goal, I think, for everybody that's treated should be a normal TSH level. It's a pretty good indicator, sort of the gas gauge of how well you're doing for replacement thyroid hormone. Uh, you can't use it in somebody with pituitary disease, though, right? Because their TSH may not be high to begin with. So in those instances, you, might, you need to use free T4 to measure how well you're doing it uh, in terms of replacement. That's why an endocrinologist is very useful sometimes um, uh, in that, it, you know, with people with pituitary disease. So the way you treat, I um, feel pretty strongly about this, is, is with a single hormone um, T4. Levothyroxine. Um, I think it can be argued by some uh, some of the literature that maybe T3 has an advantage, uh, and maybe it does, but it certainly has a great disadvantage. T3 is a much more potent hormone. It has a shorter half-life and can actually be associated with lots of adverse events, particularly in an older population. So if you're going to treat an older population, T4 is the way to go. You start in the 25 to 50 microgram. I usually start in the higher dose. Uh, 50 range, um, because 25 really is not very much. Um, but again, th the whole point is start low, go slow, and go up in increments of four to six weeks. The half-life of T4 is a week. So anything that you do, in fact, even if you start off on a relatively high dose, is going to take a week, is going to take a while to get to steady state. Four half-lives, if you want to call it that, it's going to take a while to actually develop uh, your steady state levels. So anything that you do is actually relatively slow. OK. Um, the other point is uh, that I wanted to make is that for somebody with really symptomatic hypothyroidism, and I see this maybe once a year, uh, somebody with severe symptomatic hypothyroidism, not mixed edema coma, but certainly very lethargic and very severely hypothyroid with TSH levels of 100 and things like that. For those, regardless of whether they're old or not, there's, uh, I think, uh, uh, a good argument can be made. In fact, I would treat these individuals more rapidly than starting out at 25 micrograms a day. I just hate to see somebody severely hypothyroid for months and months because you're going up at 25 microgram increments and it's taking four to six, and then they don't come back in four to six weeks, so it's another, another two months. And, and so nobody gets ever, ever gets treated for, uh, for a year sometimes and they're severely hypothyroid. Again, you have to use your clinical judgment about what is severe, but uh, there are usually individuals that are pretty, that announce themselves as being severe by the level of TSH that they have in terms of elevation. Um, <clears throat> keep in mind that the requirement, the total requirement is less as you get older because the clearance goes down with age, as I suggested. And there's a variety of, in, of medications uh, that, uh, that are taken by older individuals that may actually reduce absorption. Calcium probably and iron are the big, big ones, but things like bisphosphonates and, and um, um, PPIs are, um, proton pump inhibitors are, are ones that can also reduce absorption as well. And then there are also drugs that increase clearance, like dilantin or carbamazepine. So I'm going to switch gears now <laughs> to uh, hyperthyroidism. Um, so hyperthyroidism um, in the older um, adult does not usually present like this, in, this individual shown here. And I emphasize not. This is an atypical presentation. 
it's atypical for an older individual because it's typical for a younger individual to present this way. Um, so this individual has um, the stare, has proptosis, looks like lost weight, um, but is eating well, um, and you know, despite the fact, and eating more maybe, um, has a large uh, goiter, a large uh, thyroid gland that you can you can see from across the room or in this picture without really uh, very much uh, problem. Um, has a tremor, has got warm skin, tachycardia, all the classical symptoms and signs in this individual. So yes, it can happen in an older individual, but by far and away, this is very atypical for someone that's older to present with, with Graves' disease or hyperthyroidism in this instance from Graves' disease. Uh, the classical symptoms and signs, again, are if we go to the poo analogy, is not Eeyore, like hypothyroidism, it's, it's more Tigger. And it's really hypermetabolism that we're talking about that's, uh, that's, that are the manifestations of hyperthyroidism. Nervousness, sweating, heat intolerance, dyspnea, palpitations, weakness and fatigue from muscle loss, weight loss with increased appetite. There may be some eye symptoms, hyperdefecation. There may be an enlarged thyroid with even a brewy because of increased vascularity of the, of the thyroid. There may be eye findings, ophthalmopathy, hyperkinesis, moving around very rapidly, bouncing around like Tigger, tremor, you know, a really fine resting tremor, warm, moist hands, skin, tachycardia, and atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. Those are the classical manifestations. And an older individual, this is a key slide. Uh, I want to emphasize that they can present looking hypothyroid, uh, if, if anything. And it's, it's, uh, it's often uh, very surprising to trainees that that's the case. When someone goes in and comes in with a, with a clinical presentation that you would guess from your clinical acumen to be hypothyroid, and you do the thyroid function tests, and they're hyperthyroid. It's a real downer for the individual's um, clinical uh, skill, th the th they're thinking about their clinical skills. But this is typical of what happens in older adults with hyperthyroidism. So yes, they can develop palpitations and atrial fibrillation, but the atrial fibrillation, because of underlying heart disease, may actually be having a slow ventricular response. They may have conduction system problems. And they may be having underlying heart failure that gets worse with hyperthyroidism. But more importantly, the neurobehavioral kind of manifestations can be the exact opposite of what you might expect in the younger individuals. So instead of being hyperactive and maybe, maybe hypomanic, if anything, um, <coughs> individuals present with really profound depression or apathy and are actually lethargic. They're not hyper <coughs> hyperkinetic. They still may be irritable, but again, they're mostly lethargic. Their appetite may go down. Uh, and they continue to lose weight, so it's looking like cancer or undiagnosed um, malignancy, particularly if it's, there's nausea and constipation instead of hyperdefecation. You might think of GI cancer or something like that. There may be severe proximal muscle wasting and weakness. I didn't put this in here, but there may be also very severe bone loss and osteoporosis, um, um, and peripheral neuropathy can occur. So very important to remember Hyperthyroidism in the older individual, different kind of presentation, maybe the exact opposite of what you might expect. So this is more typical of an older individual with hyperthyroid, hyperthyroidism. Doesn't look like there's a big neck, has lost weight, but also has poor appetite. It's a little on the depressed side. Um, really no eye findings. Um, maybe a little redness around the eyes, but nothing, no swelling or anything like that, or no proptosis. Um, if anything, the, the skin is dry uh, and there's constipation. Oh, so even though you can't see the thyroid, oops, let's get this arrow here, can't see the thyroid on the frontal view, I would like to emphasize that um, when all of you learn physical exam skills, before you put your hands on the patient, you always observe, right? So I think in this particular instance, particularly uh, even in younger individuals,
it's very important to observe the neck um, and have the individual swallow before you go right for the neck and palpate, particularly from behind when you can't see the thyroid from behind. So I think it's, an, it's, it's key that uh, the inspection part of the physical examination for this is very important because if you look at this from a sort of at a tangent, uh, at, from the side, a little tangent angle, you can see, oh, i got to get this arrow here. You can see there's a the little bit of a thyroid there. And in fact, for that individual, that's an enlarged thyroid. So you wouldn't be able to appreciate really from the frontal view. And in fact, because it's somewhat vascular, and you just, if you're a hard palpator, you wouldn't be able to appreciate from behind either. So all you need to do is to have, look at it from the side with a little tangent light, have them swallow, and it goes up, and that's the thyroid gland. So this is an individual scan, and in this individual, she has a multinodular, a toxic multinodular goiter. That is, this is the thyroid here. In some areas, there's very little uptake of radioactive iodine, so it's not very active. In other areas, it's really active, it's overactive, it's, it's, there's a lot of iodine uptake, and so it's making a lot of thyroid hormone from these nodules that are overactive. And as a result of this overactivity, it's suppressing the rest of the thyroid gland that's norm, relatively normal. So toxic, meaning hyperthyroid, multinodular, multiple nodular goiter, enlarged thyroid. So as I mentioned, Graves' disease is probably the most common uh, cause in, in um, both young and old individuals. But even though Graves' disease classically, uh, as you know or may not know, is an autoimmune disease where antibodies basically cross-react with the thyroid hormone um, or the TSH receptor and, and stimulate the thyroid to make too much uh, thyroid hormone. As a result, you have hyperthyroidism, you have a diffuse goiter in old, younger individuals. You may have infiltration of lymphocytes uh, around or in, in the muscles of the eye causing proptosis and reduction in extraocular movements. You may even have it in skin. But in elderly patients, I, I would submit the vast majority of them with Graves' disease don't have any of these symptoms okay, or signs. <clears throat> That's why that first patient was very atypical. So I'm just going to put in a little bit of... Um, uh, advertising here for examining the thyroid, even though an, an older individual may not have a goiter, they may. Okay, so <laughs> it usually have, they don't, but I'd, I'd like people to understand at least what a normal thyroid um, size is, because if it's enlarged, that is a good indicator of thyroid disease in, in a younger as well as an older individual. So how does one judge the size of a thyroid? And so I use the rule of thumb, okay? And so here is the thumb, and the thumb of an individual is actually very close to the size of one of the lobes of the thyroid, it turns out. So if you have a big thumb, you usually have a big lobe of the thyroid. Now, don't ask me why that would be. Uh, and so what you do is you can put your thumb next to the thyroid, and you see that it's around the same size as that lobe. And so when you put two thumbs together, that would be the size of the thyroid um, in general. That's not including this middle lobe here sometimes, but that's very uncommon uh, to actually have that pyramidal lobe. So the two thumbs together is about the size of the thyroid. If any bigger than that, you can call it enlarged. Okay. Um, in an older individuals, this is rapid atrial fibrillation. Um, uh, I would say the majority of older individuals, particularly above the age of 75, will not have a rapid response. They'll have a slow response because of underlying condition, <clears throat> conduction system problems. The diagnosis of hyperthyroidism is, again, made with your routine thyroid functions. In this instance, however, you might want to do something else. Um, first of all, generally, free T4 levels are elevated. Uh, and as a, as a result of negative feedback, TSH levels are suppressed or markedly undetectable or uh, markedly suppressed. <clears throat> But in some instances, uh, free T4 may actually be normal. And that's because in a lot of patients uh, that are older that have this multinodular, toxic multinodular goiter, they actually can be making T3 instead of T4 from the thyroid. And so they have what's called T3 toxicos thyrotoxicosis. Um, and so if you have somebody with this situation where free T4 is elevated, 
cycle uh, is normal. TSH is undetectable. Patient is hyperthyroid clinically. Then you measure T3 because it may be a situation where T3, in fact, is the hormone that's being elevated. In individuals with normal T4 and T3 and, uh, and suppressed TSH, this is called subclinical hyperthyroidism. Again, normal thyroid hormones, suppressed TSH. Much more common, again, than overt disease. And that's generally true. Subclinical disease, thyroid disease, is more common than overt thyroid disease. Um, I, have, I mentioned again the antibodies. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disease where antibodies are stimulating the TSH receptor. And you have these things circulating, thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins, TSIs. Again, not something for you all to, to be measuring, but sometimes it's helpful for the endocrinologist that you refer these individuals to <clears throat> to measure. I would say that if you have diagnosed somebody with a newly diagnosed um, uh, hyperthyroidism by clinical uh, as well as biochemical testing. Um, you should do a radioactive iodine uptake. I think you can order that. Um, but what to do with it after that, I think, should, should be referred to, a, to an endocrinologist because it may be more difficult to manage some of these disorders than others. Uh, particularly, um, Graves' disease in the elderly is a really difficult, sometimes, um, uh, problem to manage. But there are two types of, of, of um, hyperthyroidism uh, uh, in the differential diagnosis. There's, there's two, t two main categories of hyperthyroidism. There's high uptake, and then there's low uptake or no uptake um, hyperthyroidism. Individuals that have Graves' disease will have high uptake because they have immunoglobulins stimulating the TSH receptor, increasing radioactive iodine as well as regular iodine uptake, and causing more hormones to be made. Toxic multinodular goiter, the same kind of thing, except they don't have antibodies. They just have autonomous nodules that are making thyroid hormone. Individuals with thyroiditis that have inflamed thyroid or that are taking too much thyroid exogenously, 20 to 40 percent actually, turns out, are taking too much thyroid hormone um, and so are clinically or subclinically hyperthyroid. Uh, or have radio contrast uh, induced or exogenous iodine induced hyperthyroidism will have low uptake. I recommend um, referring these out because they're really quite, sometimes quite difficult to manage. So the manifestations uh, or the hyperthyroidism in the older adult, um, not uncommon, 0.5 to 2 percent. Again, most Thyroid, hyperthyroidism in the older adults are subclinical. Uh, the presentation is extremely atypical, can be exactly the opposite of what we are normally used to seeing. Um, and I won't repeat all of this. Graves' disease is the most common cause, but toxic multinodular goiter is more common to be found in older individuals by and large. And in those individuals, they may have uh, the thyroid, these nodules actually making T3 rather than T4. So what about subclinical hyperthyroidism? Well, <clears throat> I'm going to spend a little time on this because, again, this is more common than the clinical overt hyperthyroidism. Again, TSH levels are suppressed, normal free T4. Prevalence may be about 1 to 5 percent over the age of 65, so again, a lot more common than overt disease. And there are the hallmarks of progression or risk factors for progression to overt hyperthyroidism are TSH levels that are frankly undetectable, okay, less than 0.1. Uh, they have a high normal free T4 or free T3 or total T3. They have a goiter or they have antibodies. Again, very analogous to the, to the progression risk uh, for hypothyroidism. They have the opposite kinds of risks uh, for overt, overt hyperthyroidism and subclinical hyperthyroidism. Cases. The associations are quite important to remember. Very strong epidemiologic associations of subclinical hyperthyroidism with increasing risk of atrial fibrillation, cardiovascular disease, cardiovascular mortality, hip fracture, cognitive impairment, and decreased quality of life, particularly if TSH levels are undetectable. But that does not mean that <laughs> the 
that, that epidemiologic association that does not imply that treatment of subclinical hyperthyroidism will improve outcomes, either with antithyroid medications or radioactive iodine. Um, but I think you have a lot more ammunition to base your treatment on if individuals are going to be at risk for these disorders uh, and they have a frankly suppressed TSH, undetectable TSH. And I find, I find that a lot of people, and myself included, uh, will treat individuals with undetectable TSH levels, for example, if they've already had an incident hip fracture and they have severe osteoporosis, for example. Because it's a tr potentially treatable cause or a contribution to what their disorder is, osteoporosis. So again, symptoms, uh, if they have symptoms or TSH levels that are, that are undetectable, uh, I generally treat. And if, even if they're asymptomatic and their TSH levels are suppressed, if they have these disorders, in a, and these disorders are not common or not uncommon in geriatric populations, uh, my tendency is to at least give them the benefit of the doubt and treat um, if, um, if I think it's going to do some good. Does it, in my experience, do some good? I would say 50-50, uh, okay. Uh, in the osteoporosis area where, you know, where most of my experience is, is, is that um, it definitely does good in terms of bone mineral density. But am I reducing fracture incidence? I don't know the answer to that question, really. Um, but if bone mineral density gets better, uh, I, I, th I think of that as a surrogate outcome for um, osteoporosis getting better. The treatment, again, I think you should refer to an endocrinologist because um, this is highly specialized even in the area of endocrinology these days. But a primary care physician um, <clears throat> uh, or uh, nurse practitioner or PA can do is treat symptoms. And I think it's extremely important in a geriatric population to do this, uh, is to actually at least try to adequately beta block them so that you can actually um, hopefully avoid some of the cardiovascular stimulation of excessive thyroid hormone. I would not be just doling out methimazole and radioactive iodine willy-nilly, though, and I would just refer these individuals to an endocrinologist. So in the remaining time, um, we're going to have lots of time for questions. Um, I thought we had a break, so um, I'm going to move on to the last topic, which involves nodular thyroid disease and thyroid cancer. Um, can I just take a quick drink? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know I was talking for an hour. OK. OK. So how, how does one deal with nodular disease in general? So what you have to ask yourself is, there, are there multiple nodules? Is it a multinodular process? Or is it a solitary nodule? Is there only one nodule that's, that's present? Or is, is this really not a nodule and is this, is this really a cyst? Okay. So lumps and bumps on the thyroid can be multiple, can be singular, can be a nodule, or can be a cyst if it's singular. Uh, in the case of a multinodular uh, gland, <clears throat> uh, the teaching is that, in fact, most multinodular goiters, most no multinodular glands, even without enlargement, are benign. And I think that's a good rule of uh, thumb, I guess. It's a, it's a good, good generalization. But often there are individuals with one nodule within the multinodular gland that's harder, that's bigger, that's somehow different. And I think you have to be suspicious that that is really like, just like a solitary nodule in a multinodular gland. Solitary nodules have a higher rate of being potentially malignant. Um, but most of the solitary nodules that we see these days are not palpable. In fact, they are picked up on, on uh, very sensitive ultrasound studies that are done for carotid vascular disease or for other purposes. Um, I, think, I, I think you can generalize and say, however, that the vast majority of these solitary nodules are benign. And that if you did the old radioactive iodine uptake uh, or scan, radioactive iodine scan, they would be cold. On, um, they wouldn't take up iodine very well uh, on, on these scans. However, some are cancer. And so how do you distinguish those? 
are generally benign, unless they're complex cysts and they're cystic solid kind of mixtures. So I'm going to start out with this individual with a toxic, non-toxic multinodular goiter, um, who basically is complaining that um, he gets dizzy when he puts things on the top shelf of his, of his work work room, <clears throat> and and this individual uh, says, you know, this is this is becoming bothersome. He does have a goiter, but it's not it's not huge. It's about maybe two or three times. I guess huge is all relative. <laughs> It's only about two to three times normal size thyroid here. Uh, it's not massive. Uh, and so you don't think that that's going to be a problem. But it's important to recognize that sometimes when thyroid glands grow, because it's in the neck, they can actually grow down below the sternum. Uh, and so what you feel is sometimes only the tip of the iceberg, as they say. Um, and a lot of it might be low, might be substernal. So in this instance, he has the the classic substernal goiter, and when you have him raise his arms, he then um, lowers the thyroid even more, and it compresses venous return from his head. And no wonder he gets a little dizzy because he's you know he's he's really he's really gotten a fairly um, large amount of of venous obstruction. It's called Pemberton's sign. The other other thing that you should recognize is that even though uh, a, a multinodular gland may be not making too much thyroid hormone, if you throw a lot of iodine on board, um, you can induce hyperthyroidism in a non-toxic, in a normal thyroid uh, functioning multinodular gland. Um, and I'll just I'm, I'm all one for health foods and, and, and nutritional supplements if, if given in moderation, but there are some dietary supplements like this, this kelp preparation, for example. Um, this is off online. You can get this online. Uh, this, and kombu kelp is actually very good. It's, very, it's a good Japanese kelp. But, uh, but you, if you concentrate it in a pill and you, and you eat 1,500 milligrams of it, it gives you about six to nine hundred micrograms of iodine, and the and the recommended daily allowance is on fifty micrograms of iodine, and so you're getting huge amounts of iodine. And so, individuals with an underlying tox, uh, uh, multinodular gland that's older, that's getting this for for a variety of reasons, people take kelp. Um, but for, for whatever reason, if you take this much iodine, you can actually induce hyperthyroidism in individuals with a non-toxic. So non-toxic multinodular goiter, really management issues are, there are some people that have compressive symptoms, and and in those individuals, you might need to have surgery done um, to actually relieve compression. Um, and I think this is one indication that's, that's important, for, even for older individuals, because I think the risk of falling from raising their <laughs> hands over their heads, uh, I think, is quite great. Uh, other individuals care about the cosmetics of the the way the thyroid gland looks, and you might have to have that removed as well if, if you know, after a discussion, it's extremely important. There, it, I think the risk of iodine-induced hyperthyroidism, as we discussed, is, is there and is certainly uh, uh, at risk. And the risk of malignancy probably is very low unless there's a really solid solid area or a firm area within this multinodular gland. The best approach, I think, is no treatment, is to just follow it along, as long as it's not causing complaints aggressive problems, it's not a cosmetic problem, and you can keep them away from iodine. I don't think that treating uh, individuals with excessive amounts of thyroid hormone to try to suppress TSH levels to undetectable levels uh, is, is a very good approach because, number one, it doesn't work very well. Uh, even though you may suppress TSH, the goiter remains <laughs> relatively big. Uh, and number two, you can induce hyper. You have to induce hyperthyroidism in order to suppress TSH, and then surgery we discussed. So what about a solitary nodule? The solitary nodule shown here. What what are the considerations? Um, well, first of all, there, as I mentioned, they're alluded to is that they're very common, particularly as you get older, um, and you get more um, ultrasounds of the neck as you get older. Generally, <laughs> I think. Um, and the prevalence uh, increases with neck irradiation and older individuals, and 
at autopsy, you can find about 50% of individuals will have a t solitary nodule of some type. Um, but I think the, the great problem right now is, is we're discovering a lot of these things on ultrasounds done for other reasons. Uh, the one problem is that the vast majority of these are benign, but there are about 15% that are malignant, but most of them are have some clinically suspicious um, characteristics. So this is a graph of um, um, age versus the prevalence of thyroid nodules um, based on palpation in green here and based on ultrasound or autopsy in yellow. <laughs> So the reason why we're seeing more uh, nodules is because they're being detected on ultrasound. Um, and, and I will tell you that this has generated an industry of fine needle aspiration of the nodules that are discovered on ultrasound. And it's, so it's becoming the PSA of thyroid disease, essentially. It's, it's a screening. Essentially, you're doing a screening ultrasound. You're detecting nodules that are a little borderline in size, and you're having to uh, to fine needle aspirate them to make sure they're not cancer. As I said, 15% are malignant, and those are the ones you care about because you want to discover that because, the, again, the prognosis in even in well-differentiated papillary follicular thyroid cancer is, is reduced with age. All these other conditions are benign. The risk of cancer goes up if you're male, if you're elderly, if you have neck irradiation, Obviously, if you have a family history of a thyroid, uh, inherited thyroid problem, uh, increased risk if there, there's a recent increase in size, if it's greater than four centimeters, if it's rock hard, if it's fixed, if there's local symptoms, and if they're mets. The problem becomes uh, what to do. And this, again, is really calls for a referral to a specialist, I think. Um, last time I gave this, I was suggesting because these new guidelines hadn't come up to, to aspirate uh, nodules over one centimeter. The last time I gave this, I, I was, I think I, I almost said that a primary care doc who had actually developed the, the skill, wanted to develop the skills of doing aspiration, fine needle aspiration could do this, but I'm not sure they would have the time to do it because there's so many nodules above one centimeter. <laughs> There's really a lot of nodules that would have to be aspirated if you follow these guidelines. And I would just tell you that the endocrine uh, community is really calling into question whether, in fact, one centimeter is hard and fast threshold. It's, it's really, really over two centimeters where the risk of cancer tends to go up a bit. But again, you have to live with the guidelines that you're presented from uh, various august bodies. Again, I would refer these out, so I'm not going to talk much about the management of thyroid cancer. So thyroid disease or nodular disease in the in the elderly, multinodular, very common, 60 to 80, 60 to 90 percent. Always keep in mind that some of these nodules are going to be autonomous. They're going to make thyroid hormone not paying attention to TSH. They're going to be resistant to TSH4 suppression as a result of that, and they may be sensitive to exogenous iodine administration. Again, solitary nodules, you're worried about thyroid cancer because the mortality of even well differentiated thyroid cancer goes up and and lymphoma and anaphylactic thyroid cancer are diseases of the elderly, and then more sensitive to hyperthyroidism with, with suppression of TSH. So in the last, last few minutes, I'm going to just talk a little bit about thyroid cancer. Not so much that you need to know a lot, because I think thyroid cancer should be referred to a specialist. But I'll just keep in, uh, point out that age is a risk factor for poor survival, as we discussed before. And so if you look at the incidence rate of thyroid cancer as a function of age goes up with age um, in, in yellow here. But in green, what you'll see is that the risk of, of dying from thyroid cancer, in fact, is very low until you get old, or older, I should say, um, when it does go up. I can't see this very well, and I apologize. I should have blown it up. and reduce the other garbage in here. But these are SEER, SEER um, data from cancer statistics in 2014 based on um, the SEER database. So they're, even though they were published in 2014, they're really 2000, I think, 10 or 12 data. Point, point being, for some reason, the incidence and the mortality rate of thyroid cancer, as opposed to a lot of the other cancers we're talking about, is going up in the last 
five or six years. And, and in fact, if you look at the trends, it's actually the last 15 years that the, the incidence and the, of not only the incidence of thyroid cancer, both in males and females, but also the death rate is going up, as opposed to a lot of these other cancers that are more severe. That's an un, it's unknown why that is actually occurring. So my, my prediction is that you're going to be seeing more thyroid cancer in older individuals as a result of this, uh, this increased incidence. And so you need to know a little bit about it. I think the things that you should recognize, you're going to refer them, but the things that you should recognize on the histology, and it's good to look at the histology of the thyroid uh, cancer, is that these are the high to intermediate risk factors. If the histology reveals that it is broken through the capsule or blood vessel, or that it wasn't resected completely, obviously if there's METs and an aggressive histology, those are high risk factors. It's important because when you do surgery, um, it's important to recognize that older individuals, as you get older, basically the, the risk of post-operative complications for thyroidectomy, which is the main surgery that you use for thyroid cancer, goes up as a function of age, whereas another type of neck surgery for parathyroid, um, parathyroid adenomas, has the, the incidence of post-op complications doesn't go up with age. Uh, by the same token, you know, we know that thyroid hormone suppression of TSH is very important for recurrence, uh, to reduce recurrence of thyroid cancer following thyroidectomy compared to no thyroid hormone suppression. <clears throat> What's important now uh, in terms of primary care is that now the endocrinologist is, is using some common sense, I'd like to say, <laughs> or maybe for the first time. No, I'm saying uh, it's, 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 it's important to recognize that when you try to suppress TSH, and the whole concept here is that in thyroid cancer, you remove the cancer, you remove the thyroid, and you suppress TSH so that TSH doesn't stimulate any residual thyroid left over with potentially with cancer in it for cancer recurrence. Uh, and, and it works real well, as shown in the previous slide. But, but in order to suppress TSH, you have to create iatrogenic hyperthyroidism. You have, to, you have to give more thyroid than the body needs in order to negatively feedback suppress TSH. And so as a result of that, you create hyperthyroidism. Uh, and if you're older, uh, in the geriatric population, you have to balance the risk of cancer progression or recurrence with the risk of actually suppressing somebody excessively with thyroid hormone, particularly if they have underlying severe osteoporosis or underlying severe heart disease. Uh, you know, you, you have to balance that the risk of creating hyperthyroidism and suppressing TSH with the risk of, of recurrence of thyroid cancer. And as a result of that sort of balance, what's, what's done is that uh, thyroidologists and endocrinologists have um, broken down risk of progression into high risk and low risk. And the high risks are those risk factors that I just showed you, the capsular blood vessel invasion, all of those things. And in those individuals, um, you generally tend to suppress TSH much further than individuals with low risk of, of recurrence or progression. So you, you now, for the first time, allow people with thyroid cancer to even have low normal TSH levels. They don't require suppression of everybody to undetectable levels okay, in low-risk disease. By the same token, if you have a high risk of adverse effects of over-suppression of TSH, too much thyroid hormone, uh, if you have a high risk, you know, an older population with heart and, and bone disease or something, you ease up on the suppression of TSH a little bit, albeit more than a low risk population, but certainly you want to, to re reduce, re reduce the amount of thyroid hormone uh, to avoid adverse effects of TSH suppression. Um, again, this is going to refer this out because it's becoming exceedingly complicated, but I just wanted to make sure everyone realized that this is why uh, the old way of managing thyroid cancer is no longer the way uh, most practicing endocrinologists do this. So to summarize, what I've said today is that um, thyroid disorders in older adults present with clinically atypical or nonspecific uh, presentations. 
they're confounded by comorbidities, and a lot of times uh, their presentation is attributed to old age. Subclinical disease is more common than overt disease. You should measure free T4 and TSH if someone is sick. TSH is perfectly fine for outpatient well population. Uh, but always keep in mind that misleading thyroid hormone or thyroid function tests can occur with illness. Subclinical hypothyroidism is, is by far and away the most common thing that you'll see in practice. The replacement doses of thyroid hormone that you use to treat thyroid hypothyroidism are lower. Start low and go slow. Hyperthyroidism presents extremely atypically the exact opposite presentation that you might expect in a younger population. And then um, thyroid cancer prognosis is worse and seems to be getting uh, more common uh, with time. There's a secular trend to increase not only the incidence as well as the, prog as the death rate of thyroid cancer uh, with time. And, and then when you suppress TSH as a primary care physician or practitioner, um, you need to keep in mind that what you're trying to balance is the risk of recurrence of thyroid cancer versus the risk of adverse events from um, oversuppression of TSH. That's what we just talked about. So I think I'll stop there and then maybe answer a few questions. We have about 10 minutes. How do we do this? Um, I'll read okay. <laughs> the questions to you. Reading um, the questions. Someone has asked about taking L-thyroxine um, at bedtime in most patients. Is that? You can take it any time you'd like. It's, it might be good because it's best on an empty stomach, fasting. So I actually recommend that if you can, take it um, um, in the morning, it's better. But you know, it, it's, it's fine if there hasn't been something to eat for a long period of time. Um, I, have no, I have no problem with that. I'm not sure where that question was being derived from. Keep in mind that Elfar. You're an archive in internal medicine 2010 article. Yeah, and I think it has to do mostly with absorption and differences in, in, in um, but I don't think substantially different cardi uh, clinical effects occur with that. Keep in mind that the half-life of T4 is one week. So, you know, you just need to make sure that steady state levels are, are maintained. And I think the, the biggest problem with thyroid hormone treatment are medications uh, that interfere with absorption, particularly this day and age. And in particularly in my clinic where I give a lot of calcium and bisphosphonates. <laughs> Um, so someone from Alaska is saying that fish eggs, seaweeds, kelp, and beach greens are mainstays um, of, as food sources in our Alaska Native peoples. Are there any studies as to any increased thyroid or autoimmune system diseases due to this elevated iodine intake? I don't know about that population specifically, but populations where there are lots of where there's lots of iodine intake. Uh, it turns out that, there, that the effect of iodine on thyroid is very complex. And so if you're used to it for, the, for all of your life, there's probably not as much of an effect um, as if you were coming into a situation where I think the most problematic situation, and time and time again, not only in the United States but also in other countries, is a situation where someone comes in from an iodine deficient area, let's say Africa or somewhere else, into an iodine sufficient area. That's really problematic. People that have a lot of iodine uptake and then go to a normal iodine uptake don't, um, to my knowledge, don't have much in the way of problems, uh, you know, because they're used to it for probably most of their lives. Um, but in terms of actual studies, I actually honestly don't know. I'll look into that, but at least the, the few older papers that I'm familiar with in those situations, there's really not much of a, a problem, other than the fact that I'll tell you that the TSH levels are much, uh, are much different in iodine excess populations. They tend to be. Uh, so the normal ranges in populations might actually be different in, in those populations. By what mechanism does out-of-range thyroid hormone cause falls and impaired mobility? Out of range thyroid hormone. Oh, you mean uh, hypothyroidism or hyperthyroidism? Well, hyperthyroidism is easy. It, 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 a thyroid excess, thyroid hormone excess can cause muscle loss. And I think there's no question that that, that contributes to fall risk. Um, 
but as well, both hypo and hyperthyroidism associate with nerve dysfunction um, and, and peripheral neuropathy. Uh, and so that can contribute to, uh, uh, to fall risk as well. At the same time, if they have um, underlying brain disease, what I've seen is that both hyper and hypothyroidism uh, in a younger individual without underlying brain disease would, would not affect their judgment very well, but in somebody with um, borderline cognitive uh, function, I think cognitive impairment can get worse, and as, as a result of that, they, they, may, um, they, may do, uh, they may fall as a result of that. Falls are complex, obviously, there are multifactorial reasons why you fall. So those are some um, that I can think of right off the top of my head just from experience, but I'm sure there are other mechanisms as well. Uh, and in any individual, I think that the, the whole idea of geriatrics is to, is to keep an open mind and to, to make sure that you think about uh, the individual